Welcome to Tell Me the Story, brought to you by the Friends of the Sandwich Town Archives, otherwise known as FOSTA. My name is Joan Osgood, and I'm a member of FOSTA. Uh, I'm very pleased this morning to have with me, uh, for a little chat, um, Eugenie and John Shaw. And we are in their lovely living room of this beautiful, beautiful house, which I think is about, at this point, 167 years old. Welcome. Uh, Eugenie, I'd, I'd like to start with you. I know we're going to focus on John, because John, as you've told me, is the um, uh, native of Sandwich. But I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, I know that you were born in Norway. That's Could you correct. tell me a little bit about that? And most especially, how did you come to America? And even more special, how did you meet John? Okay. Yes, I was born and raised in Norway. I went to college and I taught there for one year. In Norway? In Norway, yes. Then my aunt and uncle wanted me to come and stay with their children while they were tra traveling. So I came to stay with them. Uh -huh. And before I had a chance to return to Norway, I was offered a teaching job. Uh -huh. And after I had been there for two years, John arrived <laughs> and I met him. <laughs> And that was it. And that was it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. As I say, that was it. Um, and where was that that you both met? In, in, uh... It was in Greenwich, Connecticut. Okay. We were both teaching at a private boys' school there. Okay. And I was teaching the little ones, and John was teaching high school. Okay. So that's where, where you were at about what time in, in uh, the 19... That was, uh, he arrived in 1963. I came to this country in 61. Okay, okay. So the two of you met in, in about 1963. John, you have the most, um, you know, I've done a lot of interviews uh, under Tell Me a Story, but um, you have one of the most, or the most interesting I think, um, history your family does um, in Sandwich. Could we talk um, a little bit about that? Um, I know that from our conversation uh, prior to this, I know that um, your great-grandmother, um, uh, Mary Thatcher Whit um, Waterman, Waterman. Waterman. Uh, married uh, John W. Jarvis. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, about John Jarvis and your great-grandmother? Well, I don't know a lot about John Jarvis. Okay. Uh, but, of course, the Jarvis family, uh, with what they did with the uh, uh, running things and the glass and all of that, uh, sort of makes it for anybody who knows a bit about sandwich. Uh, archetypal. <laughs> so John actually was um, the son of Deming Jarvis, who actually uh, built and ran the Boston Sandwich uh, Glass Factory. So uh, John Jarvis um, and Mary Waterman, uh, your great grandparent, uh, they married. Um, but there was, uh, back in, I'm going to say, um, they married in the early, um, say the late 18... 1855. 1855. Thanks, Eugenie. So there's sort of a tragic uh, thing, though, with that marriage, is there not, um, back then? Well, so I understand. Uh, he had tuberculosis. He had tuberculosis, well... He said he had tuberculosis. That's John Jarvis. Yeah. Had tuberculosis. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so he, uh, they weren't married too long, uh, Mary Waterman and John Jarvis, uh, before he sadly died 
along with, I understand, two uh, of his sons who were a, children at a, that point. A, a son and a daughter. A son and a daughter. Okay, so here we have your grand -grand great grandmother, uh, Mary Waterman, <clears throat> at that point Jarvis, alone. She's lost her husband and she's lost her two children. What happens next to her, um, John? I can't remember okay. all this stuff. I have I, I could. I, well, uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you. The doctor in the town had yes. taken care of the uh, husband and John children. Jarvis. Yes. yes, and he was a widower, so she married him. So um, that was Dr. Leonard. Dr. Jonathan Leonard. Um, so he was taking care of John Jarvis, and of course knew Mary Waterman Jarvis. And after sadly uh, John Jarvis died, um, at some point uh, the two of them got together and they married. So uh, Mary uh, Waterman Jarvis married Dr. John Leonard, and that house. Of course, she was living here with her, with her first husband, but her second husband, Jonathan Leonard, really just lived around the corner, didn't he? Scarcely yeah. around the corner. <laughs> Straight across the road. Right across the road. <laughs> at, uh, um, on Main Street, I think that's yeah, 156 right. Main. That's, that's right. Yes, the, the, the Yellow House. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, so uh, so, so their, their life together, um, they did have um, one child, did they not? Um, uh, Dr. Leonard and uh, Mary Leonard at that point. Um, and they had uh, Jonathan Leonard, who happens to be, that would be your grandparent. Yes. 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 And uh, Jonathan um, married um, Melanie Norton, did, she, did he not? Yes, so your grandparents were Melanie Norton and Jonathan Leonard. And do you remember them, John? Your no. grandparents? No. Okay. No. He died they, the they, year that, now she died in 33, and he died in 37. Okay. And, and I was born in And 37. you were born in 37, yeah, John. That, so there no, was no opportunity no, for you, no, for you not, to not, know your grandparents. That, no, no. Not yes. at all. But happily, they did have um, your mother, your, uh, a child, your mother. Um, could you tell me a little bit about, um, let's start there, with your mother. What you remember about your mother. And give us a few stories about that, if you could, John. Well, I think my mother was a charming person. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, needless to say, uh, uh, I was very devoted to her, uh, partly because uh, after my father's death, uh, why that was very important. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, she brought the sandwich connection in. And because, uh, of course, he had been. I think brought up in Carver, but lived in the West for a while. This is your father? Uh, yes. And your father's name was uh, Bernard Shaw? Uh, uh, Bradford. Bradford Bra Shaw. Bradford Shaw. Thank you. And uh, in any case, uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, these, all these things are <laughs> intertwined and complex. Aren't they? <laughs> Aren't they? Uh, but I think that they, they are, but you can see the lineage, you know, which is very interesting from Deming Jarvis to his son, uh, John Jarvis, marrying into eventually uh, the Leonard family, and uh, from there on in, the Leonard family, and then finally, uh, finally, um, your, your father um, and your mother. Right. Um, yeah, this house uh, uh, has never been sold. Uh, since it was built in 1855. Yes. So, so it has remained in the remained same family. It's remained in the family. 
uh, whatever you define the family yes. to be. <laughs> well, that is it's, quite remarkable. It, yeah, it's never been sold. No. Dr. Leonard had an office here. He was a medical doctor. Yes. Yes. And he had his practice here. <coughs> yes. Okay. Just across the hall, and people could come in from the outside. I think he arranged it so they didn't enter the it front door. was a little door. Side, entrance. The side entrance. So they came in the side. They came in the side, and that's where he had his office over there. So he could keep his living quarters. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, um, you separate. don't really want people traipsing down the middle no. of the hall. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Even in those days. Um, your dad, um, Bradford Shaw, um, died when you were very, very young, John. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I'm trying to think exactly how old I was then. You were 11. I was 11. Okay. Uh, and he was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you've got to fly if you're in the Air Force, even if you are running an air base, which is what he was. Mm -hmm. He was very talented, very able, and uh, but uh, they expected, the <laughs> Air Force expected all their people to be flying now and then. Yes. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the airplane uh, had an accident and, uh, and he was killed. Now, Prior to that, if I recall, you, you telling me, uh, he was a pilot in World War II. He served in New Guinea. Uh, and uh, So that would be the South Pacific campaign yes, during World yes. War II. And so uh, yeah, they, the, the expectation, of course, at that time was the Japanese are going to invade New Guinea. Yes. And then from New Guinea, they were going to back up into Australia. Yeah. That and was the it would worry. be easier to seize New Guinea and then go back up into Australia yeah. and seize Australia. So that was a critical, critical battle. So, so that was, was, that, was a, that area. Camping. But the Japanese government got to New Guinea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. so they, they, they failed well before that, thank God. <laughs> yes, thank God, yes, yes. So, but when you think of it, how tragic. Um, he made it through with all those flights and in that, you know, horrible um, war, you know, going out on flights and, and um, you know, piloting these airplanes, made it through that, um, came back to the United States, um, married your mom, your mother. He and was married before then. Excuse me? They were married before Bef the war. Before the war. Yeah. So, but, so he, then he came back. And um, he died shortly thereafter. Forty-nine. In forty-nine. In America, in a plane crash. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. He uh, he loved to fly. Yes. And uh, the Air Force, American Air Force, uh, insisted <laughs> that all of their people, and he was the commanding officer of an air base. Yes. So I mean. If you're the commanding officer in air base and you say you don't like to fly, uh, that would not be good. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would not go over well. <laughs> but here we have your mother um, alone with an 11-year-old boy. Um, can you share some stories about, about your mother? Um, I think I believe that she, um, she graduated from Radcliffe. Um, uh, but had sole care of you for the rest of her life. Can you share some stories about that, or some of your reminiscences, of, reminiscences about living with your mom and growing up with your mother? Well, I think she was a remarkable person, uh, uh, very warm, uh, but also very able. Yes. And uh, uh, she had uh, did worked for Radcliffe uh, for a while uh, and uh, had some important positions there. And needless to say, she, uh, uh, you know, got enough money, and there was enough money as a consequence uh, that I got to uh, 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 go to a private school. You did. Uh, and uh, then uh, on to Harvard uh, and graduate school. So, you know, there, there was uh, a lot of interest in education. Yes. Uh, uh, that connection. 
uh, and a great deal of uh, enthusiasm on her part. And uh, my other uh, relatives, the uh, Leonards, uh, my uh, uncle Jonathan Leonard uh, was uh, uh, involved with the Time magazine and uh, 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 there, there was a, there's always been a lot of uh, background in that sort of thing. Yes, um, and even your children. Um, can you share with me um, what they are doing in their lives in terms of education and in terms of uh, the, the positions that they hold, uh, Eugenie? Our son is a managing editor of Harvard Magazine, and our daughter she has an MBA and works for her husband, who is an investment manager. Now, you shared with me a while ago about um, the fact that certainly what initially brought you together was your teaching down in Connecticut, um, but also your love of horticulture and plants and flowers. Um, describe that a little to me. Well, our first date was going for a walk in the woods. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> that's typical. <laughs> and then when I came here and saw the gardens oh. here, <clears throat> it certainly reminded me of the big garden we had at home in Norway. In Norway. My father was a minister, and we lived on a farm, mm -hmm. and we had a very large garden. Flowers and, I would imagine, uh, vegetables and whatever, you know, so that you, uh, to supplant your eating. Yes. Oh, during the war. Oh, boy. That was very important. Very important. Because really nothing was imported. Yes. I remember the first time I saw an orange. <laughs> yes. And I asked, is it edible? <laughs> and I bite into it. <laughs> was that over in Norway or when you arrived that, here? That was in 45, after the war. After the war. Oh, you yeah. had never seen really I an had, orange. No, I had and, never. And of course, never, never eaten one. No. Oh my gosh. So John, you really did, uh, you were a smart fella. You uh, immediately recognized that uh, Eugenie loved gardening, loved horticulture. You, for your first date, you took her on a walk in the woods. And of course, you were really smart about bringing her to this lovely, lovely home here. Um, can you describe, let's talk a little bit about this home and, and the historical significance of it. We've already, we've already talked about the fact, so I'll uh, just uh, set uh, the background that uh, Deming Jarvis gave the money uh, to his son, John Jarvis, to build this unbelievable house um, as a wedding present. And he thought it was very expensive at $7,000. <laughs> $7,000. <laughs> that? I'm yeah. not sure the exact figure. Yes. But, well, but, but, but Mary Waterman uh, was a powerful personality too, oh, she was. I'm sure. Yes. And uh, needless to say, uh, uh, they, they did well by she, it. She, I have no idea what the cost was. Yes. Uh, but uh, it, uh, uh, this is a very well-made house. Uh, it, you may think that these walls are wood. They have bricks uh, between the inner and the outer. So this house the, was totally initially built out of brick. Not initially. It was, yeah, it was built with the two sides of, yes. uh, and the brick between. In between, yes. That, that was the insulation, <laughs> uh, if that you want to call case. it that. <laughs> insulation was... <laughs> the insulation well, did, did not exist. Did not exist at that point. But if you want to have a substantial house, put brick between the inner wall and the outer wall. <laughs> it could also have been uh, connected to the fact that he had tuberculosis, and they thought that it would protect him. How interesting. Yes, because they really didn't know, you know. Uh, people were dying, you know, left and right with the tuberculosis at that point. Right. Um, so they thought that that might protect him. Do we know whether um, 
Uh, the bricks came from the uh, sandwich uh, brick factory down over on Town Neck. Do we know? Do we know? I don't know that, but uh -huh. frankly, uh, no one would go further. <laughs> well, that's true, John. I mean, you really at that time, and if you if you have a brick factory in the next town or nearby, yes, you are not going to send to Boston for your brick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. There's a lot of exposed brick in the basement and also in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps um, you can, uh, you know. And, and I understand that the between the walls here, there is no insulation. That didn't exist. Yeah, yes. But between the walls, the inner wall and the outer wall, it, the whole house is brick. So. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's used as a, uh, just the, the, the bricks are placed in there, but it's not really a, a uh, uh, architectural construction need. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. So that would, if it's not an architectural need, then that would perhaps go back to what you've said, Eugenie, that perhaps um, with the tuberculosis, and of course he ended up dying of that, and as I understand his two children did also. Yeah. And he was only 28 when Gosh. he died. Wow. Yes. They yeah. married very young. Yes. So Deming Jarvis sort of gave them free hand. Here's the money, about $7,000. And uh, John Jarvis and Mary Waterman Jarvis, um, I imagine with an architect, designed this house. And this house has stood here pretty much the way that it is now. We'll, we'll talk, if, if I'm going to ask what changes might have been made, for 167 years. What changes? Do you remember the name of the architect? No, I don't offhand. He built the first Boston Public Library as well, and then moved to California and built a lot of houses in San Francisco. Some of them burned in oh. 1906. Yes. I think his name might have been Kirby. I think you're right. Yes, yes, and he was a very famous architect, uh, well, in the Boston area initially. Yeah. That's probably how they got him. I mean, they spared yeah. no expense, let's face it. Yeah. Yes, right. yes. Now, um, there have been slight changes, I would imagine, although the house is, is pretty much uh, the way that it was way back then. What modernization have you done, if any? Kitchen and bathrooms. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Paint and wallpaper. Paper and wallpaper. That's what yes, we that, have yeah. done. Yes. But Dr. Leonard made some changes. Yes. He built the side entrance for his doctor's office. Yes. And also, that was not the dining room originally. Okay. There was a door going out with steps going down to the ginkgo, oh. and there was a carriage drive around the ginkgo. Oh, can we talk about, since you've brought it up, I, I did want to talk about this. This ginkgo tree, which is very, very rare, you think that this was planted uh, by either Deming or John Jarvis, back 167 years ago. I'm, I'm sure yeah. that's the case. Yes. Yeah. It was. Yes. And why is, why is a ginkgo tree so special? You don't see many of them around. Well, I think this is ancient. very, or, I think this is, they're, they're one of the most ancient trees. They are. In existence. Uh, and, but uh, uh, they've always been uh, adopted by people who really want something special. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, I think that was true even in China. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but to have a ginkgo tree in uh, 1857 or whatever it mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, that would be, that was a good thing. Yes. Uh, now, whether they chose female ginkgos or male ginkgos, I don't think that was uh, part of the uh, <laughs> gestalt. <laughs> <laughs> part of the thought, because if, this if is a female. Come. Uh, yes. Yes. And what makes that uh, maybe a little different, or perhaps not as preferred? Um, we were talking about that earlier. Well, yes. if, if green in, trees, they won't 
males. They yeah, do. They, yeah, the, the, the reason is uh, the fruit is about three quarters of an inch in diameter. It has a nut. It's soft, but it has a nut in it. That, if it falls on a pavement, is like a roller bearing. Step on it. If you step on it, <laughs> you will. <laughs> okay, and it's not very fragrant, as I understand. It is really a disgusting smell. Okay. <laughs> but but the, you know, uh, the, we don't. We're not affected by that because it's not that many of a lot of fruit. Yeah. And we have grass and. And a and lot of squirrels come and gather up the nuts. They, they the are not love them. discouraged in the least. <laughs> <laughs> How about your snowdrops? They are just absolutely unbelievable. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your snowdrops and why those are, uh, why this property is sort of known for them? I would say that uh, snowdrops like damp soil. Uh, this is right, this house is right on the edge of a marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, as a consequence, there's very rich soil around the house, unusually rich soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, therefore, the snowdrops uh, thrive. Ah, yes. And uh, so, uh, you know, when you're a horticulturalist is, uh, 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 by uh, avocation or whatever, uh, as I am, uh, that uh, you uh, uh, recognize that the plant chooses the right place. <laughs> <laughs> so it's either you choose it or the plant chooses you. That's yes, right. Yes. There were a lot of snowdrops here, the old-fashioned double ones, mm -hmm. originally. Ah. But since we retired, John has planted all yeah. these over here. So what, what, how I understand it to be is that this was a lovely garden, certainly before the two of you retired oh, and, and, and started to live here full time. And, but of course, you just embellished upon that. Well, I'm um, sure that uh, uh, when the, uh, Mary Waterman uh, Jarvis lived here uh, and uh, she married into the Jarvises, and the Jarvises were not impoverished. No. <laughs> and no. So needless to say, I'm sure there was a permanent gardener, uh, and things looked very good. Yes. That's yeah. just... Even... Now, now, of course, at that time, that's so early. That's, that's b little before photography, so we don't have any yeah, pictures <laughs> yeah. of what it was like in uh, 1857 or uh, 1865. We don't, we don't have any of that. One of the things I would like to talk about um, before we um, uh, finish our chat here is that um, your grandparent, your grandmother, John, uh, Melanie Norton, uh, before she married um, Mr. Leonard, Jonathan Leonard, um, you had shared with me that um, the town didn't have a seal. Um, a town seal um, for many, many years. And back, uh, I think it was in the 19, 1900, the, the state of Massachusetts said now each town needs to draft, needs to have a town seal. Um, your grandmother um, had a big, played a big part in that. Can you share uh, that story, please? I, I don't really know a great deal about it other mm -hmm. than that she had a part in it. And uh, she uh, used as a base, the town seal of Sandwich, England, England, which had lion's heads on the front of the ship. So, yep. And she put eagles. She there thought that it would be more appropriate um, for America for and for the town of Sandwich to have eagles. Yes. But so she actually designed. Um, the uh, Sandwich Town Seal back in 1900 and 1901, which has remained that way with very few changes um, to this point today. Um, you know, I, I think that's really something, you know. Uh, so she must have had uh, quite an artistic um, bent also, um, you know, as... Uh, she was an illustrator. She was. Well, her husband was more of a painter. Okay. They um, were both very artistic. 
Uh, did she illustrate uh, for magazines, or um, how did that how did that work out? I think magazines and some children's books too. Oh, and children's books. But we have some wonderful um, paintings of hers. You do. Yeah. You do. A, a great talent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do any of your children have those talents? Did it come down to? Uh, I'm if they haven't, <laughs> they haven't expressed it. Okay. <laughs> well, this has been uh, such a lovely visit. I am, number one, so grateful to you to open up your house um, and allow us uh, to come in uh, with all um, SCTV's technology <laughs> and rearranging your furniture. It's just been a lovely, charming visit. And, um, you know, I'm sure that uh, people that are listening to this um, will certainly have an appreciation of um, the ancestry, um, not only of uh, Eugenie um, Overnoy, but uh, even uh, perhaps more especially for the town uh, of Sandwich, um, your ancestry going back all the way to Deming Jarvis. Quite extraordinary. And, and, and well before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, hasn't this been a very interesting and lovely conversation with Eugenie and John Shaw? Um, I'm so glad that you were able to join us. And uh, before we sign off, I do want to thank uh, Paula Johnson and her team of expert <laughs> technology uh, people to have come into the house and set this up for us so we can have this lovely conversation. See you again next time for Tell Me a Story.